right. It is 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Obsessive Compulsive Disorders, Seeking Order in the Disorder with Megan Kramer. My name is Danielle Daly. I'm the Professional Development, Co Development Coordinator here with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping things um, and then hand it on over to Megan. We are going to run from 10 to 11.30 this morning. Um, I don't think Megan has any planned breaks in there, um, so make sure you're all set up and ready to go. Everyone is muted and your cameras are disabled. Please use that chat box like everyone I've seen already doing this morning. Thank you so much. Um, use that chat, bo chat box to interact throughout the webinar, um, whether that's asking questions um, or providing resources. Um, experiences, anything of that sort. Um, you can also use that Q&A as well to ask questions. Um, it kind of helps us keep track of those questions a little bit better. Please visit our um, website, icpn.org. You can view our upcoming webinars um, as well as view some of our past webinars. It'll link you to our YouTube page, which has some of the recordings from our past webinars. You can also sign up to receive mailing um, mailings for upcoming webinars. Uh, you'll be the first to know. Um, and you can do that on the top right hand corner of our website, icpn.org. Um, we have a couple of webinars on the website currently, um, one for August 30th, um, which is utilizing ACT to address staff trauma and burnout. Um, and we also have one on the website for um, September. September 27th is exploring the complexities of grief. Uh, so be sure to visit our website and sign up for those. As far as continuing education certificates, please give me about 14 days to get those out to everyone. Um, there are a lot of people registered and a lot of people attending today. Um, so it does take me a little bit to get through those, but please give me about 14 days to get those out to everyone. They will come to the email that you registered with. If you do not receive yours after that 14 days, please reach out to me. Um, I will put my email address into the chat box so that you have it, but it is D D A I. L E Y at hope.us. So D daily at hope.us. Um, I will put all that information into the chat box um, so that you have it. Uh, and I think, Megan, we are all ready for you. All right. Thank you. Um, so, as Danielle said, my name is Megan Kramer, and I'm a clinician with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. I've worked here for a little bit over 10 years now. Um, and we will be discussing obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD today. Um, throughout the morning, I will be referring to it as OCD just because um, for the sake of ease, um, a lot easier to spit that out than obsessive compulsive disorder throughout um, the morning. Um, I will give you a heads up. I'm not good at monitoring the chat box or the questions. Um, it's definitely a bit of a squirrel moment for me. Um, I will get lost and not be able to figure out where I was or what was going on. So Danielle will be keeping an eye on that and we'll pop in. Um, we will have some set times for questions. And if there's things that are really relevant, Danielle can pop in throughout um, the morning with those as we go. Um, so, but please do feel free to participate in the chat. Um, my, key, my keyboard wasn't working for a minute. Um, so this morning we will be talking about um, OCD, as we already said. Um, we'll get a good understanding of the definition of OCD, as well as the etiology of the diagnosis, how someone with OCD may feel, um, comorbidity with other diagnoses and OCD, treatment um, for OCD, how, some, how OCD impacts the IDD population. So we're going to do just a general overview first and then kind of get more specifically into the IDD population. So, um, and then we'll look specifically at OCD and autism spectrum disorder. And then finally, we'll get into some practical support strategies for supporting um, someone in the IDD population who carries a diagnosis of OCD. So, um, to begin with, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, is a long-lasting disorder in which a person has uncontrollable reoccurring thoughts, also known as obsessions, and behaviors, which are known as compulsions, that he or she feels the urge to repeat over and over. Um, it's important to note that the more severe the OCD is for an individual, the more impaired the person's social functioning is likely to be. Um, anxiety is almost constant and heightened and can be a counter can become counterproductive 
and interfere with the person's ability to live a normal life. So um, when re people refer to OCD, you'll often hear them referring to anxiety as well, um, as it is extremely connected to um, obsessions and triggers for obsessions, um, as well as behaviors. You know, the um, compulsions that people engage in are likely to cause a significant amount of, um, of anxiety as well. Um, and then finally, OCD is one of the most common psychiatric illnesses, um, in fact, affecting approximately 2.5% of the population. So that's a pretty significant amount of the population that is impacted by OCD. So it's very likely that a practitioner may encounter someone with, who carries that diagnosis at some point in their career. OCD is classified as the presence of either obsessions compulsions or a combination of both. So it's not necessary to have both compulsions and obsessions to carry the diagnosis of OCD, but it is very common to do so. And for the purposes of what we're gonna be discussing this morning, we're gonna be looking at it, um, the diagnosis as though someone carries or it has experiences both the presence of obsessions and compulsions, um, just to give us a more well-rounded understanding of the diagnosis. Obsessions are, um, so this information comes directly from the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, and this is used to, for um, practitioners to help with um, developing an understanding and diagnosing um, mental health diagnoses. Um, so the information that we're going to be looking at here comes directly from that. Um, so obsessions are um, classified as recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive and unwanted, and that in most individuals cause marked anxiety or distress. Um, and then the individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or neutralize them with some other thought or action, such as by performing a compulsion. Um, so we will get into more specifics on obsessions and what they look like in a little bit, but just to give you some idea of common obsessions that people may experience, we're talking about um, obsessions around things like dirt and contamination, a need for symmetry, um, obsessions around sexual content or aggressive content, and superstitious fears. So again, this is from the DSM-5. Compulsions are repetitive behaviors such as hand washing, ordering, checking, or mental acts, such as praying, counting, repeating words silently, that the individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. The behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. However, these behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive. Um, so again, we'll get into more specifics on compulsions in a little bit, but some common compulsions include cleaning and washing, arranging things until they are quote unquote just right, checking things, um, repeatedly mental rituals such as counting. Um, and it is important to note that obsessive compulsive symptoms vary considerably, um, not only from person to person, but within the same person over time. So, um, you know, just because two people carry the diagnosis of OCD does not mean that it's going to look the same. You know, the way that uh, one person displays their obsessions or compulsions may be completely different from how another person does. Um, and just as much a, a person who is diagnosed with OCD, those obsessions or compulsions that they experience may change throughout the course of their diagnosis. Um, I do want to note as well that OCD often stems from the fears behind people's anxiety and compulsions are performed to relieve that anxiety. Um, so again, we're seeing that anxiety is very connected to OCD. Some additional criteria from the DSM includes that um, the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming, such as they take more than one hour per day or cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The obsessive compulsive symptoms are not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, such as drug abuse, dr a drug of abuse, a medic or a medication, or another medical condition. And finally, the, the disturbance is not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder. 
So here are a few statistics or numbers for you. Um, so um, the, I do wanna note that these numbers apply specifically to the United States. Um, so 2.3% of the population experiences a lifetime prevalence of OCD. 1.2% of US adults have OCD. I do wanna note that I did find in another um, source that 2% of adults in the US have OCD. So again, that number does vary a little bit according to current research, but it is pretty significant. Um, at this point in time, 50% of adults with OCD experience significant impairment with 35% of adults with OCD having moderate impairment. And finally, 14% of adults have with OCD having mild impairment. Rates of OCD are typically higher in women than in men. However, we will see later on when we're specifically talking about the IDD population that that um, reverses and rates are higher in men than in women. And finally, or um, and 10% of OCD sufferers question their sexuality. And then finally, 18 to 29 year olds have the highest levels of OCD in the um, population. And again, this apply this data here specifically applies to the general population, not specifically to the IDD population. I do want to make a distinction that OCD and obsessive um, compulsive personality disorder or OCPD are two distinct diagnoses. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information, we're not going to get into this really, but I just want to give you some background information just for your knowledge. Um, OCPD um, is described as follows according to the DSM-5 again. Um, so a person who carries a diagnosis of OCPD is likely to be preoccupied with details, rules, lists, order, organization, or schedules to the extent that the major point of the activity is lost. They may show perfectionism that interferes with task completion. They are excessively devoted to work and productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendships. The person may be over conscientious, scrupulous, and inflexible about matters or morality, ethics, or values. They, um, they are unable to discard worn out or worthless objects, even when they have no sentimental value. Um, they may be reluctant to delegate tasks or to work with others um, unless they submit to exactly his or her way of doing things. They may adopt a miserly spending style towards both self and others. Money is often viewed as something to be hoarded for future catastrophes. And then finally, they show rigidity and stubbornness. And I do want to make a note here that, again, what we are talking about specifically today is someone who carries an actual clinical diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, we often hear people talking about, you know, all my OCD tendencies are coming out, right? Um, I know I say it, I definitely have OCD traits or tendencies within myself, um, but I do not carry a clinical diagnosis of OCD. Um, so when there is, people will talk about OCD behaviors or tendencies, that's not what we're talking about today. Although you may recognize some of that in people based on what we're describing today, um, we're gonna to be talking about the clinical diagnosis of OCD. Um, and then there is also postpartum and perinatal OCD, which are connected specifically to pregnancy, both during and following pregnancy. Um, but again, we're not going to get into those today as they're completely separate diagnoses. Um, this I thought was helpful to kind of see some of the differences between OCD and OCPD. So with OCD, um, it is a mental Ill illness marked by recurrent, intrusive, unwanted thoughts and repetitive behaviors. People with OCD often feel marked anxiety or distress due to their symptoms. And again, as we talked about earlier, symptoms can fluctuate with anxiety, you know, or we may see um, the symptoms that people display of their obsessions and compulsions or in OCD varying in time. Whereas OCPD is a personality disorder in which someone always wants to be in control. Signs include strict orderliness and perfectionism, and OCPD traits tend to be persistent over time. So you're not going to see that change in how someone displays their obsessions or their compulsions as you might with an OCD diagnosis. So um, at this point in time, it really is not known what causes OCD um, in an individual, what triggers it in someone. Um, there is ongoing research into it, um, but there really has not been a definitive answer at this time. 
Um, so while neurological counts have been discovered as contributing to the cause of OCD, current research has not been able to definitively point to a specific cause um, of the diagnosis. There are, it is known that biological, physiological, and environmental factors can all be contributing to factors to um, someone developing the diagnosis of OCD. So um, as far as chemical, as far as the biological factors go, chemical imbalances in the brain, faulty brain circuitry or genetic defects are possible causes of OCD. Um, and I want to read a quote here that comes from a site that um, is doing research into the treatment of OCD. It says that a combination of neurobiological, genetic, behavioral, environmental, and cognitive factors all influence the onset of OCD in vulnerable individuals. Recent studies on brain images of people with and without OCD indicate that OCD symptoms are a malfunction in communication signals between different areas of the brain. The areas most significantly affected are the orbital frontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex, the thalamus, and the striatum. Um, the neurotransmitters that send messages to these parts of the brain are also different in people with OCD. Dopamine, serotonin, and glutamate are all affected. So, I mean, based on the current research going on into the biological factors that can be contributing to OCD, it's pretty clear that um, it encompasses a wide variety of different areas of the brain. Psychological forces that underlie are um, psychological factors that could be contributing to OCD are include forces that underlie human behavior, feelings, and emotions, and how they might relate to early experience. Um, you know, th things like psychodynamics and personality um, play a part, as well as um, rigid thinking, avoidance, and internal conflict. And then finally, environmental factors can be contributing to um, people developing OCD, including social stressors, trauma, and abuse. So currently researchers know that um, people who have suffered physical or sexual trauma are at an increased risk for OCD. So when diagnosing an individual with OCD, a medical professional or a therapist is gonna be looking at the following areas. So they're really gonna be looking at the, um, a physiological evaluation. So they should be meeting with um, someone who may carry the diagnosis and really asking them to describe their symptoms, um, developing a good understanding of what it is a person is experiencing and going through. They're gonna look at the diagnostic criteria um, in conjunction with the DSM-5 at what, um, you know, if they're lining up with the criteria that are required. And then a physical exam should be completed to rule out anything else that could be contributing to the concerns. So really before getting a diagnosis of OCD, a really comprehensive um, evaluation should be completed. Um, so when diagnosing someone, a trained therapist will um, determine the presence of obsessions, determine the presence of compulsions, and then they'll determine if the obsessions and compulsions are time consuming and the impact they have on the individual's daily life. Um, so the obsessions and compulsions typically are gonna take a lot of time and get in the way of important activities that the person may value, um, such as working, going to school, or spending time with friends. So it's gonna have a significant impact on a variety of areas typically um, of a person's life. At this time, there really is no specific test that can be used to diagnose OCD or um, concretely determine whether or not someone carries the diagnosis, but there are a variety of um, scales and tests that can be used to help make that determination, um, it's, but there's nothing definitive. So at this time, the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale um, may be used, and this is a scale that looks at a variety of topics that are commonly associated with obsessions or compulsions and ask people to rate whether or not they have experienced those at some point in the past or currently are, and then um, scores that to help determine whether or not a person may have OCD. Um, and there is an, ad an adaptation of the scale that can be used for children. So at this point, let's consider how someone with OCD may feel. 
It is known that people who experience obsessions or for people who experience obsessions that they are intrusive. They're typically unwanted, unpleasant, uncomfortable, distressing, anxiety provoking. Um, and that includes anxiety around ideas, images, fears, thoughts, and worries. So it's pretty all consuming with how that impacts someone in their daily lives. Um, and the, I mean, based on that, that sounds pretty overwhelming, um, honestly. Some common obsessions that people may experience include, um, can, include areas around contamination. So that's concerns around germ, exposure to germs and diseases, dirt and chemicals and the impact that could have on someone, losing control, so fear of yelling or swearing, fear of stealing, fear of intense mental images. And again, it's not saying that anybody's acting on these fears um, or these fears of losing control, but just the fear that, they, that it may happen. Perfectionism, so concerns about exactness, fear of losing things, unable to decide to keep or throw things away. Um, harm, so there's a fear of responsibility for events or fear of hurting others. And again, this doesn't mean that it's something that they've actually done, but you know, you could be driving down the road um, and for someone who has OCD, there may be an accident and they may be um, worried that they caused that even if they were not at the site when the accident occurred. So it could have happened before or after, but um, fear that their behaviors may have caused that accident to happen. Um, religious obsessions. So excessive concern with right and wrong, concern with blasphemy. Um, and again, with a lot of religious beliefs and um, religious traditions, there is a certain amount of ritual um, to those beliefs. And that, you know, following that, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's when that become is taken to the extreme that it can become an obsession and problematic. And then finally, other obsessions. So concern with getting an illness um, and superstitious about lucky numbers or favorite colors. Um, you know, with that concern of getting an illness, you know, we all have a certain amount of concern around that, you know, oh, I'm going on vacation, I don't want to get sick. Again, that's not an indication that you may have OCD. It's like taking it to that extreme where you may not go out and see people because you're so afraid of becoming sick. You may not allow other people into your home because you don't want to be exposed to germs. Um, people who have compulsions may experience repetitive behaviors or mental acts. Um, compulsions are done to ignore, reduce, or eliminate anxiety or distress. They may be executed according to rules, and that is not necessarily according to societal rules or norms, but according to a person's own rules um, that they have determined internally are acceptable or required. And then finally, um, there's a possibility of sensory phenomena. Um, and sensory phenomena is a term used to define uncomfortable or disturbing sensations, perceptions, feelings, or urges that either precede or accompany repetitive behaviors such as compulsions or tics. A person with OCD might feel driven to repeat compulsions until they experience a sense of relief from these uncomfortable um, sensations. And sensory phenomena can be divided into physical and mental. So examples include sensations in the skin, um, quote unquote, just right perceptions and feelings of incompleteness. Um, this is mo sensory phenomena is most commonly um, found in people who have Tourette's disorder and OCD. And then um, an example of that would be for, so someone walks through a door frame and they bump an, L an arm on the door frame, they bump their left arm. Then they need to because they have that physical sensation, that sensory phenomena, they need to bump their right arm as well to get that same phenomena. And you may see someone bumping their arm repeatedly until they get that same physical sensation um, that they had just experienced on the other arm, you know, to get it to be just right and then experience that feeling of sameness. So some common compulsions that people often experience include compulsions around washing and cleaning. So washing hands too many times, you know, many of us have seen movies where that has occurred, where someone um, washes their hands repeatedly or might carry a bar of soap with them. You know, someone may get up from the table in a restaurant to go to the bathroom every time they touch something to go wash their hands. Um, excessive showering or bathing, cleaning household items too much. Um, I mean, I worked with someone who 
would literally clean the surface that she worked on at her day training program so much that she rubbed the finish off of it. You know, she would spray it and rub it and spray it, you know, and did it so many times throughout the day that the finish was um, coming off the table. Checking, um, compulsions around checking, that could include checking repeatedly that something has been completed, checking that nothing terrible has happened, and checking that you did not harm yourself or others. Repeating, so rereading or rewriting things over and over, repeating routine activities. And then there's mental compulsions. We talk about that, you know, that um, count, or sorry, we haven't talked, um, counting during tasks to end on a good or right number. Um, and then other compulsions could include collecting items with significant clutter um, or avoiding situations that could trigger obsessions. So some examples that I can give you from my personal life um, with regards to that. So um, for the mental compulsions for that good or right number, um, again, I don't carry a diagnosis of OCD, but I definitely have some OCD tendencies or traits. Um, and I really like it when the numbers on a device, you know, end in an even number or a five for whatever re reason, I prefer those and fives are okay to, for me, even though they're not an even number. Um, but I'm really glad that my car, for example, doesn't show me the number that the volume is at. So I don't worry about that as much. However, I do on our TV, um, it's listed um, or the numbers there. So I may, if my, if I had the remote, I'm going to always make sure that the volume is on an even number or a five, or if my husband has the remote, I may ask him to adjust the volume up or down one to get it to an even number. Um, if he doesn't, it's okay. You know, it's not going to upset me. It's just something that I would prefer to have happen, but because I don't actually have OCD, it's not going to be something that I can't sit there and watch TV until it's fixed. Um, for checking, um, for example, I have young children. Um, and part of my routine is that, um, I, before I go to bed every single night, I go and check each of my kids. Um, you know, I, you're, I'm checking to make sure they're okay, that, you know, they don't need anything, that they're where they're supposed to be, you know, um, honestly, making sure they're still breathing. Um, but I check them once. I don't check them 10 to 20 times within an hour or two. And that's where that becomes problematic or obsessive um, um, or, you know, those behaviors become problematic in that someone who checks repeatedly, you know, you just put them to bed, they're fine. Five minutes later, you're in the room checking on them. You know, it can be something that can become interruptive, um, you know, prevent them from having a good night's sleep um, so that it takes it to that next level. Um, some other examples I can give you. So um, my brother-in-law does carry the diag a clinical diagnosis of OCD, um, and he gave me permission to use him as an example today. Um, so part of what he was doing that made him realize he needed to seek some assistance in managing um, what was going on. Um, and getting the diagnosis was that every night before going to bed, he would spend an hour or 45 minutes to an hour every single night um, going through the house and checking the doors to make sure that they were locked. Um, his house is relatively small. Um, you know, he can see two to three doors from one place. Um, and he would go and just repeatedly check to make sure they were locked. Um, he couldn't get into bed until he had done it enough times to the point that he was feeling comfortable with it. Um, he would also check that the stove and oven were off. Um, he's a bachelor, a guy who really does not do a lot of cooking. So he maybe uses the silver oven about one time a week. So for the most part, he would have no reason to check that the silver oven were off, but he would, um, repeatedly and compulsively check them. Even if he had not, he knew he had not cooked anything that night. Um, you know, and it got to the point where, again, it was preventing him from getting sleep because he was staying up later and later checking these things, um, in the morning before he would leave the house, he would bring his dogs inside, get them settled, check that all the doors were locked, locked, um, check that multiple times, then get into his car, back out of his car and sit at the end of his, or out of his driveway and sit at the end of it and watch his backyard for about five minutes to ensure that um, the dogs weren't outside. You know, he knew that he had brought them in. He knew that the doors were locked, but he had to um, watch to make sure that um, nothing was wrong and that they were, um, where they were supposed to be. Um, so again, it's something that became very encompassing of his day and prevented him from being able to um, engage in other activities. And I'm sure a lot of people have other examples that you can share. So um, feel free to put them in the chat and we may be able to get to some of those later on. 
So um, compulsions are more than a ritual or a habit. Um, for something to be considered a compulsion, it must cause marked distress or be time consuming and interrupt people's routines. So what I just described was, you know, it was very time consuming. It would take up at least an hour of his day. Um, it became distressing. You know, he was worried about the safety of his house, his dogs, himself, um, you know, whether or not that stove was on. You know, I know that that can cause a lot of anxiety for people. Um, and it was very interruptive to his routine. He couldn't get ready for bed and get in bed because he was constantly engaging in those, um, in those compulsions. Um, people are, people cannot control his or her thoughts or behaviors, even when those thoughts or behaviors are recognized as excessive. Um, they spend at least one hour a day on these thoughts or behaviors. They do not get pleasure when performing the behaviors or rituals, but may, <clears throat> excuse me, may feel a brief relief from the anxiety the thoughts cause. Um, so people really, you know, it's known that when people carry a diagnosis of OCD, they really experience concerns around guilt or anxiety because of the need to complete these acts. And they know that it can have an impact on other people around them. Um, and that can be really um, disruptive to people. And then they, they may experience significant problems in their daily life due to these thoughts or behaviors. So this cycle um, specifically obviously applies to someone who um, experiences both obsessions and compulsions with their diagnosis of OCD. Um, but I thought it was a good way to really understand and look at um, what someone with OCD may be going through. So for someone who um, may experience an obsession, so such as, you know, obsessions around, excuse me, contamination or dirt, um, that, um, you know, people may have a belief that um, if someone enters their home, they're going to be exposed to germs and they may get sick or, you know, um, become gravely ill or their loved ones may become ill um, just because some a new germ or contaminant is entering their home. This then causes marked anxiety or increased anxiety in an individual um, to the point where they, it develops to that point where they cannot handle it anymore and they need to act on that. Um, so they engage in a compulsion. Um, so, you know, in an example of someone who has an obsession around dirt or germs, um, they may, someone, you may see someone obsessively um, engaging in hand-washing behaviors. Um, someone who, you know, has fears around um, someone entering their home, they may um, want to shower every time someone enters their home and make everybody else in their home shower. Um, you may have see people asking people to put on booties when they enter their home or not sit, you know, because you could leave a germ behind. And if you're wearing a booty and standing, you know, it's less likely that you'd leave those germs. Um, or you may see someone not even allowing people into their home at all. Um, and then finally, um, when someone engages in that compulsion, they experience some temporary relief. Um, and it's temporary, it's momentary. Um, before those thoughts start becoming intrusive again um, and becoming obsessions. Danielle, at this point, are there any questions? There are. Um, there are actually two questions. Okay. Um, the first one from Allison, she asked, um, and I know that I think you're going to touch on this a little bit later, um, but she asked, how do you know if someone has OCD or autism? Um, because many of the examples that you were providing seem to be things um, that those with autism may display. Yeah, and so we will get into that specifically in a little bit that um, the um, crossover of someone who carries both diagnoses of OCD and autism, but I will kind of just tell you right now, it's really hard. Um, it is very hard for practitioners to distinguish that, um, and we'll get into this a little bit later as well, but I think, you know, that's where we see a lot of the people we work with um, don't necessarily carry an official clinical diagnosis of autism. Um, you know, we... I work with families all the time who they say, oh, my kid has autism, you know, and, or sorry, has um, OCD. Did I say, I said that wrong, I think. Um, that, you know, you may not see people carry an actual clinical diagnosis of OCD, but do have autism because it's really hard to distinguish that. So we'll get into that a little bit more later on, um, but it is a definite challenge and there isn't unfortunately a definitive answer. And then um, the other question was from Marjorie. She asked, how do you help someone with hoarding behavior who refuses therapy or counseling? Again, that's, it's challenging, you know, and hoarding is actually a separate diagnosis now from OCD. Um, so we're not going to get specifically into that because um, it used to be under OCD as a diagnosis, 
um, I think it was hoarding and like skin picking, I want to say were um, both under OCD um, in the DSM four, but are now separate diagnoses. Um, you know, I think you really have to get buy-in from people. You know, if you're talking about an individual who does not carry an intellectual disability, you have to get buy-in from them to want to change. Um, that's, you know, we can't force change on people. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles that people experience, you know, is that we can't force people to get treatment. Um, people have to be willing to accept that and recognize that they need that um, support. Um, with um, people we work with, you know, the people we support, um, depending on, you um, what their diagnoses may be, their level of disability, whether or not, you know, um, they have a guardian, you know, that can make a difference, you know, if the team were to have a discussion about, you know, this is a real concern, we see these hoarding behaviors, and there's things you can do, different techniques you can put in place, you know, where if you bring something in, you have to remove something, um, but again, it really has to be a team approach, um, and I think we'll get into some of that more later on when we talk about some of those, you um, proactive strategies we can do to help with that. Um, so hopefully we'll kind of hit on that a bit more, but again, hoarding is considered a separate diagnosis at this point. And we actually had another question come okay. through while you were talking. So um, this person asked, what differences might there be between obsessive thought and what we typically understand as rumination? Goodness, um, good question. So I didn't really see rumination coming up in um, the research I was doing, you know, I was thinking about this last night, actually, where, you know, I was thinking I should have a note in here on perseveration that it is different in that, you know, that obsessive thought is, can be so consuming, you know, for so someone with um, obsessive thoughts that are connected to OCD, it is going to be extremely consuming. Like we said, at least an hour a day that someone's going to be focusing on those thoughts. Um, whereas like something with perseveration, it's, um, that can vary, you know, it may be momentary, um, you know, I was thinking about that in conjunction with some of my clients, you know, um, that, you know, someone may perseverate on this topic um, until they gain access to it or, you know, an item until they gain access to it. And then once they do, they move on. Um, whereas someone who has OCD is less likely to move on as easily from that once they gain access to it, get an answer they want, things like that. Um, so I think, you know, it, obsessions go further is kind of my understanding of that, you know, that it's more to the extreme. Okay. We did have a couple other questions come through, but I'm going to, I think we'll hold off on those for right now and let you keep going. Okay. All right. Um, so we do know at this point that with OCD, there is a high risk of comorbidity, um, with other mental health diagnoses. So, um, 92% of individuals with OCD have at least one other disorder. Um, and the average number of comorbid disorders in people with OCD is almost three per person. So that's pretty significant when you really think about it, that for someone who carries a diagnosis of OCD, and again, this does not apply specifically to people with intellectual disabilities. So it's not even including an intellectual or developmental disability as one of those diagnoses. Um, but we know that, um, that people who have OCD have at least typically three other di uh, mental health diagnoses, which is pretty significant. Um, so people who have OCD are also likely to have um, these other diagnoses um, in accordance with the DSM-5. So 63% of people who have OCD are also likely to carry a diagnosis of major depression or bipolar disorder. 76% of people who have OCD are likely to have other anxiety disorders. So that's things where like hoarding can come in. That's considered, um, you know, kind of under that classification of um, a, an anxiety disorder. People who have OCD, are, 23 to 32% of people who have OCD are also likely to have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And then finally, um, up to 30% of people who have OCD are likely to have a lifetime tick disorder. Um, so then, um, these diagnoses are more, occur more frequently in individuals who have OCD than in people who do not have OCD. 
Um, so trichotillomania, so that is the compulsive hair pulling out with leaving bald spots. So you may see people just in there kind of twirling the hair and pulling out, you know, small piece, chunks of hair until it leaves a bald patch. Um, then exoriation, and that is um, excessive skin picking or obsessive skin picking, uh, positional defiant disorder, Tourette's syndrome, and that includes the combination of both behavioral and vocal tics. Um, and then other research points to body dysmorphic disorder and eating disorders, but the data is limited in that area still. And then finally, disruptive behaviors. Um, so again, for someone who carries, um, these diagnoses occur more frequently in people who already carry a diagnosis of OCD. And then as far as these diagnoses, this differs a little bit in the sense that if someone carries the following um, diagnoses, they should be assessed for OCD as well, because if they have one of these diagnoses, they are more likely to have OCD. Um, so they should be um, assessed for those um, by a practitioner. So 12% um, of people who have schizophrenia also carry a diagnosis of OCD. Um, also 12% of people who have schizoaffective disorder have OCD. And then you also see this commonly in bipolar disorder, eating disorders such as anorexia and bulimia nervosa, and then finally Tourette's disorder. Um, so when treating OCD, um, practitioners are really going to be looking to aim, the aim is going to be to reduce symptoms. Um, it is getting rid of OCD in and of itself is very, it, it's not the focus, you know, we're looking to reduce the symptoms, make them manageable so people can re-engage in their daily life um, in a way that is satisfying to them. Um, so when treating OCD, the um, options that are currently available include psychotherapy, medication, and neurological interventions. Um, a combination of therapy and medication is often used to treat OCD. That's going to be typically what most um, typically what is used as treatment. Um, and psychoeducation should involve providing detailed information about all aspects of the illness, including possible clinical symptoms, impact of comorbidity, treatment options, duration of illness, duration of treatment, um, and the risks to the family accommodation and how to best deal with family members with OCD. Um, so really psych psychoeducation should be both for the individual and um, family members or other people who are frequently um, a part of that person's life. Um, and the goal should be um, to help the individual manage their stress. Cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT is a um, therapeutic modality or approach that is commonly used to treat OCD and is known to be highly effective at treating OCD. Um, so C CBT folk teaches different ways of thinking, behaving, and reacting to the obsessions and compulsions that a person may be experiencing. They change neg it changes negative thoughts into more positive, effective ways of thinking. And then exposure and response prevention, or ERP, is a um, type of CBT that is frequently used to treat OCD. So ERP, um, the way that that works is through exposure and response prevention. So exposure is practicing is when someone pr is practicing confronting thoughts, images, objects, and situations that cause anxiety or provoke obsessions. And the response prevention part of that involves making a choice not to be uh, not to do a compulsive behavior once the anxiety or obsession has been triggered. Um, so all of this is done under the guidance of a therapist at the beginning, though the person will eventually learn to do their own ERP exercises. Um, independently to help manage their own, their symptoms. Um, over time, the idea is that the treatment will quote unquote retrain the person's brain um, to no longer see the object of the obsession as a threat. Um, and for about 70% of people who, um, about 70% of people will benefit from ERP and or medication for their OCD. So that's pretty significant um, number of people that um, med therapy and or medication um, can be helpful for. Some additional therapeutic options that may be available to people include traditional outpatient treatments, intensive outpatient treatments, day programs, partial hospitalizations, residential programs, and inpatient hospitalization. Um, so as you can tell, this kind of goes from least restrictive to most restrictive. 
with obviously the goal being to avoid the more restrictive forms of um, therapeutic treatment. So um, for people who receive traditional outpatient therapy, they're gonna see a therapist for individual sessions, um, typically one to two times a week. Um, for someone who receives intensive, in, sorry, intensive outpatient um, therapy, they're gonna attend both groups and individual sessions at least one day um, up to several days a week. For a day program, that is when um, patients attend treatment at a, um, or sorry, um, they're gonna attend, sorry, I had this wrong. Um, yeah, sorry, so when someone attends a day program, they're gonna attend treatment during the day, typically both group and individual sessions. Um, at a mental health treatment center, usually from nine to five, up to five days a week. So may not be a full work week, but um, quite possibly could be. And then a partial hospitalization is the same as day program, a day program, but patients um, get attend their treatment at a mental health hospital instead of um, in the community. And then a residential program um, is where someone is treated while living voluntarily in an unlocked mental health treatment center or hospital. And then finally, for an inpatient program, obviously this is the highest level of care for a mental health condition. Um, treatments are provided on a locked unit in a mental health hospital on a voluntary or sometimes involuntary basis. Um, and patients are admitted to the, this level of care if they are unable to care for themselves or a danger to themselves or others. With the goal of this um, program, of inpatient programs being to stabilize the patient, um, which generally takes several days to a week and then transition them to a lower level of care as soon as possible. So medications are also an effective tool for treating OCD. Um, there is a, at this time, there really um, isn't a great definitive answer as to the most effective um, medication to treat it. However, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs are most commonly used to treat OCD. Um, there really isn't enough evidence to determine which one or one of these that is most effective at treating it for people. Um, so the choice of an SSRI that is used should be individualized and take into account potential drug interactions and tolerab tolerability for each individual person. Um, so at this point, fluoxetine, or also known as Prozac, fluvoxamine, paroxetine, um, which is known as Paxil, and sertraline, which is known as Zoloft, are most common are um, the typical go-to um, SSRIs for treating OCD. With citalopram, which is Celexa, and escitalopram, which is Lexapro, also commonly being used um, to treat it. It is known that at this point. Um, People who carry a diagnosis of OCD and use an SSRI to treat it do require a higher dose of the SSRI compared to other indications that SSRIs are used for. Um, and then clomipramine, which is anaphronil, is a tricyclic antidepressant, and it is used when SSRIs have not been proven to be effective for treating OCD. And this was previously the, a first-line pharmacological treatment for OCD. However, concerns about its safety and adverse effects um, kind of moved, made people move away from it and start using SSRIs instead. Um, people were also developing treatment resistant to OCD. Um, so again, that's where SSRIs are gonna be the initial go-to medication. It is important to note that both psychotherapy and medication can take some time to work. You know, there is no magic wand. Um, it's not gonna be a fast fix. It will take time. Um, and work with um, both of those courses of treatment. And then finally, there are a number of neurological interventions that are available to treat OCD. Um, research is ongoing into different forms of neurological interventions. Um, and there isn't, you know, these are really considered to be the last last course, you know, the um, nothing else has worked. And so we've got to look at other options um, last course of treatment for OCD. Um, especially when it comes to surgical interventions, you know, all other forms of treatment should be exhausted first. Um, but there is evidence to suggest that um, some of these treatments are effective at treating OCD, but they're not concre concretely proven so at this time. So one of the options that is available is brain surgery. Um, and this does recall 
choir cutting into the skull, um, gain access to um, the brain and a heated probe is used then to burn the anterior cingulate cortex, which is one of the areas that we know um, is affected by OCD, one of the areas of the brain that's affected by it. Um, and this has proven to be effective for about 50% of people for whom therapy and medication were not effective. Um, but obviously there's always risks involved with brain surgery, um, which is why it's not as much of a go-to. Um, gamma knife is a non-surgical procedure that is used. Um, and so with this procedure, multiple gamma rays are passed through the skull. Um, on its own, a single gamma ray um, does not pose any danger to brain tissue. However, when gamma rays intersect, the energy level is high enough to destroy the targeted brain tissue. And this has been found to be effective for about 60% of people for whom therapy and medication were not effective. There is deep brain stimulation or DBS. And this is completed by placing electrodes in targeted areas of the brain that are connected to a pulse generator implanted under the collarbone. Um, and results from these studies indicate that this is as effective as the gamma knife and brain surgery interventions. Um, but trial groups have been very small, um, so it's not used as commonly for OCD at this time, um, but it is used more often for treatment of Parkinson's. And then finally, there's transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, and this is a newer intervention um, in treating OCD, but it is proving to be pretty effective. Um, so I'm going to read a quote to you from the International OCD Foundation um, because I, this was completely new to me. It was not something I had heard of before, um, but this quote really helped me get a better understanding of um, the treatment. So TMS is a non-invasive way of stimulating or changing activity in the brain using magnetic fields. During treatment, patients sit in a chair while a TMS device is pressed against the outside of their head. Um, inside the device is a wire coil. When an electrical current pass, is passed through the coil, it generates a magnetic field. The magnetic field passes through the hair, scalp, muscle, and skull and into the brain, where the magnetic field changes the brain activity. This magnetic field can be targeted to reach and stimulate specific areas of the brain, including those involved in OCD. The patient may feel a tapping sensation on their head during treatment, but people receiving TMS are not being shocked by electricity. Patients are not sedated during the procedure. Discomfort is typically mild and patients can return to their normal activities immediately. Um, so there seems to be a lot of promise in this treatment modality. And if you haven't looked up pictures of it, I would recommend looking it up. Um, it's basically like this big box, like helmet type thing that comes over here. It's bigger than a helmet. I initially kind of pictured of a helmet that's got a big arm coming out of it connected to a machine. Um, so it is interesting to see. Um, and TMS is currently being used to treat a wide um, range of mental health disorders and health problems, including major depressive disorder, migraine headaches, and tinnitus. Were there any other questions at this point, Danielle? Yes, so we did have one come through. Um has a little bit to do with diagnosis as well as um, techniques. So it says that there's a tendency of individuals with Down syndrome to also engage in obsessive behaviors. So how do you know if this is a separate diagnosis or a feature of Down syndrome? And then what techniques can you use to help these individuals who then may become obstinate or defiant? Um, so again, we'll kind of get into that, um, the comorbidity with other diagnoses. You know, we do know that people who have OCD, um, are, or people who have Down syndrome are more likely to have OCD as well. You know, it comes that comorbidity occurs very frequently. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of research. I found very minimal. I could find research on comorbidity with autism and OCD, but I really could not find research into comorbidity with Down syndrome. Um, I'm hoping that some of those techniques we discuss at the end of the um, session will um, help answer some of those more specific questions you have about techniques on how to manage that. So um, give me some time and we'll get to that at the end if that's okay. Um, and then um, Brittany had um, expressed that she works with an individual who has cerebral palsy and use, utilizes a wheelchair um, that she actually drives with her head. So her arms are strapped down. The only way that she's able to get someone's attention then is to verbally um, request attention, right? So she asks the same questions repeatedly and becomes pretty obsessive. 
even after getting an answer, she returns and asks again. So it can be almost distressing to her. Um, she's just curious if you have any techniques of how to help this individual. Um, so in that situation, it may be related to OCD. It may not be. It could just be that she's looking for that connection and interaction, especially if that's her only way of kind of gaining people's attention, you know, and asking those questions, she's more likely to get an answer. Um, so again, without really knowing the person, you know, I think there's things that can be put in place, you know, proactively as far as regular check-ins with her, um, you know, kind of having that, um, you know, schedule time where staff are going to have a one-on-one -on -one time with her, you know, sit down and have a conversation, um, you know, and I would do that pretty regularly, honestly. And then if that's not enough, um, there's things, you know, one of the techniques we use with people, um, some of my clients are, you know, moving on, you know, we've or asked and answered, you know, using phrases like that, we can respond that way. And then I'd redirect that into, again, effective um, conversation, you know, not just kind of shutting them down, but trying to have more of those um, personal interactions with them. And then the last one here from Loretta, um, it says her adult child's doctor has said that if there is an emotional instability um, or a mood disorder, that a mood stabilizing drug is helpful before an SSRI can be effective. Um, she just asked if anyone had thoughts on this. Um, obviously, I know, Megan, you're going to say that you are not a professional in that yep. area, and so you cannot speak to that. Yes. Um, but if you have any experience or if anyone else has any experience or thoughts that they want to share about that. And I would say one of the things that, you know, we I kind of mentioned at the end is just with that comorbidity of diagnoses, it can be really hard to determine what needs to be treated first. Um, you know, so if you have co-occurring mental health diagnoses, you know, you've got depression and a mood disorder and, um, you know, OCD and bipolar disorder, you know, whatever it is, what do you treat first? You know, I mean, what's the priority um, as far as addressing? And so that, you know, that's where you kind of have to hope that some of those treatments can cover multiple behaviors, multiple symptoms, multiple from multiple diagnoses, um, because that is a real challenge for um, caregivers. Absolutely. And that looks like that was it for the time being. Okay. So we'll go ahead now and shift gear a little bit and talk about um, OCD and the IDD population more specifically. So hopefully we'll get to um, kind of more specifics on a lot of those questions that um, people have been asking at this point. Um, so according to the NAD website, Estimates of the frequency of dual diagnosis vary widely. However, many professionals have adopted the estimate that 30 to 35% of persons with intellectual or developmental disabilities have a psychiatric disorder. Um, you know, based on my own experience, I do suspect that this number could even be higher. You know, I think there's a lot of underreporting of symptoms um, and then just of diagnoses, or as we're going to talk about that separation of diagnoses, you know, separating autism and OCD or Down syndrome and OCD can be really challenging. Um, and in the research I was doing, you know, it was really hard even for the researchers to identify the difference between those diagnoses. Um, so we're not alone in that, you know, I know that doesn't help necessarily, but it can make us feel a little bit better, hopefully, knowing that researchers struggle with this too. Um, so I do, like I said, I do suspect that there's probably a higher occurrence of, um, of diagnoses, mental health diagnoses in the IDD population. And we do know that there's a higher occurrence of mental health diagnoses in the IDD population than the general population anyway. Um, obsessive compulsive disorders are known to occur in patients with intellectual disability at rates at least proportional to the general population but often the developmental disabilities and lack of communication in these patients make it difficult to diagnose and assess the disorder and hence go undetected and untreated. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, when we were answering one of those questions, you know, I have families all the time tell me, oh yeah, you know, my kiddo has, you know, um, their OCD behaviors and this and that. And, you know, when I ask, you know, they don't necessarily carry a clinical diagnosis of OCD, you know, but a family can list off all of these tendencies they have, you know, both obsessions and compulsions, um, but they don't actually have that diagnosis because it can be so difficult to 
assign that diagnosis to someone when they have multiple other diagnoses. Um, and then many mental health professionals do not properly recognize the co-occurrence of psychiatric disorders and intellectual disabilities um, or intellectual disorders. So this is something we still um, experience, you know, challenges with that, you know, psychiatrists or other mental health professionals may not be comfortable working with our population or really that differentiating the diagnoses that people experience. Um, the severity of the intellectual disability may make it hard to diagnose OCD. So we'll see that, you know, um, you know, the severity of the IDD of um, autism, things like that can make it a lot harder to actually assign a diagnosis of OCD. Um, and this is especially true of people whose intellectual disabilities create a significant lack of communication or a developmental hindrance. So again, we're gonna see that more in the profound to se um, severe to profound range of, of IDD. And then one difficulty is that people with intellectual disabilities are often noted to have significant traits of perfectionism. So their need for routine and dislike of change will cause them to be very regimented. So again, that can be a factor in a number of other diagnoses that we work with. And so it can be really hard to separate that from OCD specifically. So if you're not familiar with it, the um, DMID-2 or the Diagnostical Manual of Intellectual Disabilities is a great tool. Um, it really looks at um, the mental health uh, um, disorders that are listed in the DSM-5 and breaks it down into how modifications that may need to be made and how um, that diagnosis applies to people with um, intellectual disabilities. So it's a great way to um, better understand that, um, how um, mental health disorders may impact the people we work with. Um, so there are no adaptations listed in the DMID-2 for applying the diagnostic criteria from the DSM-5 to people with intellectual disabilities, whether they have mild, moderate, severe, or profound disabilities. However, there are a number of notes that are important to take into consideration. Um, so I do want to note here as well that the um, specific content of obsessions and compulsions um, is different for all individuals, although common themes do or can occur, um, especially around cleaning, symmetry, harm, and forbidden or taboo thoughts. So I know this is a lot of reading and I apologize for that, but I just couldn't find a better way to <laughs> present it. Um, but this chart really, or table breaks down the differences between the DSM-5 or not the differences, but the notes that are being made to take into consideration with our population. So it um, has the cri diagnostic criteria from the DSM-5 and then how that's applied to the, um, for people with mild to moderate ID and the people to severe and profound. Um, so those notes, I wanna kind of go over those notes um, and develop a better understanding of that. So for um, obsessions, they're defined by, again, um, recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges or images that are experienced as intrusive and unwanted and typically cause marked anxiety and distress. So the note that applies to people who carry a mild to moderate ID um, diagnosis would be that they may not, the, the, um, the obsessions that a person experiences may not be considered intrusive and unwanted for, by that person, depending on the cognitive functioning of the individual. And then the note for the severe and profound um, diagnosis is also the same. Um, so, you know, that can be really hard that, you know, something that we would see as something that would typically be um, problematic or cause anxiety, cause distress for a person may not in the IDD population. So it's something that they may be experiencing, but they may not, if they're able to self-report that. Um, you may not see that distress. So you may not be thinking that, oh, this person, what they're thinking about is causing them distress. It could be problematic. They may be okay with the thoughts, even if they are consuming and something that would typically cause distress. So it's still important to be aware of that, um, even if they are not causing, they're not being considered intrusive or unwanted for a person. That second criteria for, from the DSM is that the individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or to neutralize them with other thoughts or actions. So the note there for the mild to moderate is that the individual may or um, may or may not attempt to ignore or suppress due to cognitive deficits. So again, if someone's not experiencing distress from them, why are they going to try to suppress that? Um, they may try to, they may not. It really depends. Um, and then the difference here for the severe or profound is that the individual may be um, able to, unable to report wanting to ignore, suppress, or neutralize obsessions. 
So even if it is distressing for that person, they may not be able to communicate that um, or they may not be able to ignore that um, just due to their level of um, disability. Um, people with IDD often do not try to hide their symptoms of OCD um, as they do not see them as problematic or as socially inappropriate. So oftentimes we'll see in the typically developing population that people will try to hide those tendencies. They may try to go about their normal life and hide um, their obsessions that are causing them distress and not let people know because it's, you know, it can be embarrassing for people. It can cause a lot of distress and guilt and grief. Um, and so for this population, they may not be able to effectively, um, hide that or may not even try to. Um, then as far as compulsions are concerned, um, they're defined as repetitive behaviors or mental acts that the individuals feel driven to perform in response to an obsession or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. So the note here is that um, repetitive behaviors or mental acts um, may be difficult to elicit due to cognitive deficits and limited expressive language skills. So it's important to consider ordering or consider um, behaviors such as ordering, telling, asking, or repetitive physical acts such as rubbing as or as compulsions. So in that case where um, you know that was brought up in the questions, you know asking those questions repeatedly can be considered a compulsion. Um, again, we can't say definitively without um, getting that diagnosis, but it's something that is worth looking at. Um, you know and bringing up to a practitioner as a possible concern. Um, and then for the note for the severe and profound criteria is that the absence of compulsions that require abstract thinking does not rule out OCD. So just because someone doesn't have um, a compulsion that they're acting on, that should not rule out their ability to get that diagnosis. Um, observe individuals for compulsions um, requiring simple thinking, such as fixed sequences or arrangements excessive ordering and filling and emptying of things like containers. And then that final um, criteria is that the behaviors or mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some dreaded event or situation. However, these behaviors or mental acts are not connected in a realistic way with what they are designed to neutralize or prevent or are clearly excessive. So the note here for the mild to moderate diagnosis is that functions of compulsive behaviors may not be ascertainable due to cognitive deficits and limited expressive language skills. Um, and then recognition of excessiveness or intent of the behaviors may not be present. Um, and the difference for the severe and profound, that first part is the same, um, but then the criteria regarding intent of the behavior does not apply to individuals with severe or profound ID. So it just doesn't apply in this case. Um, I do want to make a note that um, young children may not be able to articulate the aims of their behaviors or mental acts, so it can be harder to diagnose OCD in um, young children who have um, um, intellectual disabilities. And then um, the criteria regarding the intent of the behavior does not apply to children who carry an intellectual disability. So that was a lot, I know. Um, I apologize, we'll get into kind of um, a bit more um, and how to manage um, the diagnosis. So we do know that there are difficulties with diagnosing an individual with OCD who carries another diagnosis. We've talked about that already. Um, it can be really challenging to distinguish the symptoms of OCD from those of other diagnoses. Um, people often do not always, um, or people do not always appear anxious or share complaints or symptoms of anxiety. So this is where as caregivers, that documentation part of our job is so important. Um, we know, we know that if someone is not showing signs of anxiety does not mean that they do not have it. They may still be, have anxiety. They may still have OCD. Um, we really need to document things that are observable. So, you know, we may not be able to get in their head and understand what their obsessions are, but if we see them engaging in a behavior that could be considered compulsive, we need to make sure we're documenting that. And that can be then shared with um, practitioners such as psychiatrists, neurologists, things like that. Um, many people engage in repetitive behaviors already. You know, we know that speech and vocalizations and so that can be a real barrier to diagnosis. And then many co-occurring stereotypes um, combined with the session are, and compulsive behaviors are found in these other diagnoses. Um, so tics, 
um, dyskinesias. And so that dyskinesias are the involuntary erratic writhing movements um, in face, arms, legs, and trunk. Dyskinesias, uh, or sorry, um, athetosis. Um, and that, and I may be pronouncing some of these wrong. I apologize for that, but that is a condition in which abnormal muscle contractions cause involuntary writhing movements. Um, and this is common in people who have cerebral palsy. Um, dystonias um, are neurological movement disorder characterized by involuntary um, muscle contractions that cause slow repetitive movements or abnormal um, postures that can occasionally be painful. And then akathisias are an inability to remain still. Um, and then, you know, we often see um, in individuals, individuals we support self-injury and self-stimulatory behaviors um, that are repetitive um, and could be considered obsessive or compulsive. Um, so, sorry, my screen is blocking this. Um, I'm just gonna read this from my notes, I apologize. Um, so some of the difficulties that we see with um, diagnosis and according to the DMID2, some additional difficulties that um, could be included in diagnosing a person include limited expressive language skills that may be present um, cha are challenging for self-reporting and using um, scales. So things like that yellow brown obsessive compulsive scale can be used, but it can also be challenging to use that. Um, it's not always um, effective for people, you know, they may not be able to self-report effectively enough, um, to use that. Sensory impairments may be a contributing factor to multiple diagnoses. Symptoms may not be experienced as anxiety producing, or people may not be able to effectively communicate these symptoms to clinicians. Obsessions may be, may not be perceived as intrusive or unwanted, or communication barriers may prevent sharing these symptoms. Compulsions requiring abstract thought may not be possible, um, and counting skills may be absent. Suppression or ignoring obsessions may be a difficult concept for people to understand, and attempts to do so may not be made. There may be difficulties in communicating the intent of behaviors, and they may make it challenging to identify compulsions as intended to reduce anxiety. A lack of understanding and awareness of societal disapproval of behaviors may not help to reduce them. And then finally, aggression may be a primary concern, and it should be specified if this is due to a caregiver's removal of an obstacle or their attempt to prevent a compulsive act. Um, so, it, you know, um, it's important to, you know, distinguish that if you are trying to prevent someone from gaining access to an item um, due to your belief that um, they're having, they have an obsessive behavior around that item, that not gaining access to that item could cause aggressive behaviors in that person, which is different than someone engaging in aggression for other reasons. Um, as I did note earlier, hoarding and skin picking are different diagnoses now um, under in the um, but are still related to OCD. So that's you know some of these behaviors we may see a lot of overlapping with that. Um, and results, this often results in OCD frequently being underdiagnosed in people who carry an IDD diagnosis. So um, we talked a little bit already about that comorbidity with other diagnoses. Um, so in addition to the other mental health diagnoses we previously discussed as being comorbid with OCD, there are also high prevalence rates of comorbidity with autism spectrum disorder or ASD, Down syndrome and prader willi syndrome. And again, the research that's out there on even these diagnoses where we know there's a high comorbidity rate is very, very minimal and limited. Um, we will talk more specifically now about um, OCD and autism um, together um, because we do know that there is a significant correlation here. So according to Martin et al, approximately 17 to 37% of young people with ASD also display symptoms, so specifically symptoms of OCD, whereas approximately 5% of young people with ASD also carry a diagnosis of OCD. Um, and that's significantly higher than it was for the general population. If you remember, that was about 2% of you at the U.S. population of adults carries a diagnosis of um, OCD. So that's a lot higher. 23% um, of people with ASD and OCD have another co-occurring psychiatric diagnosis. 
And then people who carry both a diagnosis of autism and OCD are more likely to be younger when they receive the OCD diagnosis, and they are more likely to be male. And again, that differs from the general population where females were more likely to carry a diagnosis of OCD. And it is likely that OCD is underdiagnosed in this population due to a lack of clarity of symptoms, including symptoms of ASD being more prominent than those of OCD or the symptoms of OCD being considered a part of um, autism. So again, some of those difficulties um, that practitioners may experience with um, differentiating the diagnosis include that many symptoms and or behaviors associated with the OCD are also common with autism, making accurate diagnosis particularly challenging. Um, so, you know, symptoms of anxiety can be present in both diagnoses, repetitive behaviors, social problems, lack of insight, general inability to emotionally and socially connect with others, um, angry outbursts can be can occur, and then frequent and at times extreme and unpredictable changes in mood can occur, and impulsivity. Um, so people may not see their compulsive behaviors as problematic or something that needs to be changed, and they may not experience anxiety around them. So this applies specifically to people who carry both OCD and autism diagnoses. Um, you know, so this is particularly true um, with autism, where a lot of people engage in um, where the behaviors that a lot of people can engage in may be comforting to them. You know, those um, self-stimming behaviors can actually be comforting for a lot of people. Um, typically, compulsions are completed to reduce feelings of anxiety, but for people with autism, anxiety can become can come from different concerns such as impulsivity, overstimulation, and misunderstanding of social cues. Um, and then, so an example of this that I liked, um, that I found in my research was that um, for, if someone has a behavior of turning on and off lights repetitively, so they're constantly flicking a light switch, um, someone who has OCD, may, um, that be, for them, that behavior of turning on and off the light is going to be um, ritualistic and perform to ward off feelings of anxiety, um, where, and pleasure may come from the temporary relief of the anxiety that they were feeling. So again, think of that cycle. So they perform that act and um, they're gonna experience some relief from that. Whereas someone who has autism can complete the action because it may, or may complete the action because they experience self-soothing pleasure just from the act itself. So it's not even necessarily giving them anxiety in that case, um, but rather um, just enjoyment of the act, you know, seeing the lights turn on and not feeling that switch in their hand. Um, and so that really differs from the typical or from someone who has OCD where that um, they may have some relief from engaging in that act. And then finally, people with um, ASD may experience feelings of euphoria or pleasure by completing compulsions rather than feelings of guilt and or anxiety, resulting in them feeling as though their compulsive behaviors are beneficial for them. Um, you know, so we know that oftentimes people in the typical population, um, when they have OCD, those behaviors, those compulsions that they feel that they have to engage in may cause them a lot of guilt and grief um, or stress, you know, on their an impact on their daily lives um, because they know it has, they know it has a significant impact on others. Um, it can cause them an inability to work or engage socially with their friends and family. Um, whereas someone who carries a diagnosis of autism and OCD may not experience that. You know, again, this is a generalization. I'm not saying they always experience that, but they may not. Um, you know, it may be something where, you know, the, it feels good to them and it doesn't bother them as much that other people see their behaviors as inappropriate. Um, attempting to analyze fears behind compulsive behaviors in someone with autism would not necessarily be effective um, as these behaviors are not really driven by fear or anxiety, whereas in OCD, those behaviors are more commonly driven by fear and anxiety. So this table really looks at some generalizations of um, diagno the diagnoses of OCD and autism, and then that overlap. So again, I know this is generalization, does not apply to everyone who carries one of these diagnoses, but I thought it was a good way to kind of break it down and see the differences and similarities. So for someone who has autism, social, they're going to experience difficulties around social emotional reciprocity, difficulties around conversation, you know, they're going to have reduced interest in conversation oftentimes, 
Um, they're going to may have poor nonverbal skills. They may lack facial expressions. They may misinterpret social cues, um, may have difficulty adjusting to different social environments, and they may have difficulty understanding, developing, and maintaining insight into their actions and behaviors. Whereas someone who carries, who has an intellectual disability um, or not, um, but carries a diagnosis of OCD, may recognize um, um, that the thoughts and urges and images they have are unwanted. They may have normal thought perceived, normal thoughts being recognized that normal thoughts being perceived as illogical. They may attempt to ignore, suppress, or nor, ignore or suppress the thoughts and urges that they are experiencing. Compulsions aim to reduce anxiety and distress, and they may have a level uh, of insight into um, their behaviors. And then finally, that crossover occurs where repetitive you know, with repetitive behaviors, um, um, obsessions or compulsions around objects and speech, um, repetitive urges and inflexibility with routines and sensitivity to the environment or fixed interests. So there are a lot of challenges that we see in supporting people with um, IDD who, and this, so this isn't necessarily specific to autism at this point, but just IDD in general. So we know that there's a general lack of resources um, available, or sorry, I do want to note first that we know that there is no cure again for OCD. Um, current treatments enable most people with this disorder to control their symptoms and lead full productive lives. Um, a healthy lifestyle that involves relaxation and managing stress can also help combat OCD in people. Um, so we know that there's often a lack of resources. Um, you know, there's a lack of research into interventions that are available for the population we work with. Um, mental health practitioners are often not comfortable working with people with intellectual disabilities um, or believe that traditional therapeutic interventions are not effective, which simply is not true. Um, CBT and ERP um, is effective for this population, um, oftentimes in treating OCD, especially for those who carry a mild to moderate um, diagnosis. Inconsistent information can be a barrier you know, we know that there's often a lack of that social history that's passed on um, to agencies or um, from caregiver to caregiver. Um, lack of documentation may be a barrier. Um, staff turnover can be a concern. Um, so, you know, when those areas occur, you know, it makes it really hard to have a consistent understanding of um, a diagnosis. You know, there may be a staff who really has a good understanding of someone's diagnosis, and then when they leave an agency, um, there may not be someone who has that um, level of understanding of the obsessions or compulsions that someone had. Medications, um, you know, we know that there are oftentimes medication interactions. We know the people we work with are often on many interactions and we see those um, medication interactions or frequent medication changes, um, making it difficult to um, really support someone. Um, or treat someone. And then um, their intellectual disability can be a barrier in and of itself. You know, the, the, oftentimes we do, or sometimes we do see um, that the ability to profit from CBT can be limited, but that's more so in people who carry a profound to um, severe diagnosis. Um, and then finally, mental illness itself. We talked about this a little bit earlier. We're determining that priority for the mental illness, which one you're going to treat first. Um, you know, we saw that People who carry a diagnosis of OCD um, often carry three other mental health diagnoses. Um, and so, you know, there's a, which one is the priority for treatment, you know, um, whether through therapeutic measures or um, medication. And then we know that there is that high prevalence of comorbidity. So treatment for the IDD population, um, you know, we know that, um, as I said earlier, um, treatment approaches or that therapy really can be effective. So we know that treatment approaches for people with IDD are similar to the typically developing population with the primary courses of treatment, including therapy, medication, or a combination of therapy and medication. Um, those neurological um, treatments that we discussed earlier really don't differ for this population. So I'm not going to get back into them. Um, and then medications also that are used for this population are consistent with those being used for the general population with the SSRIs being the primary course of medical treatment. Um, so we're not going to get into that now um, again, but we'll talk more specifically about therapeutic interventions.
So as I mentioned earlier, CBT really can be effective um, at treating um, OCD in this population. Um, studies have shown that it can be effective. Um, and so one, um, one way that I found really helpful to work on this was um, presented to me through one of my professors in graduate school who really broke down um, CBT into your head, heart, and hands. Um, so you're really looking at their, at your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors and the way that they interplay with each other. So for someone who's experiencing an obsession, you know, you're going to be looking at that thought, your, their head, you know, what's going on in your head when you have that obsession, when that thought occurs to you, um, then what do you feel? Um, what is your body telling you? What is your heart telling you, um, is going on with that obsession? And then how do you act on that? Your hands. Um, your behavior, what do you do when you have that thought or your body tells you, your heart tells you something. Um, so this is something that I found to be effective when working with clients to kind of help them develop a better understanding of their thoughts and emotions and behaviors um, by really looking at it from that kind of head, heart, and hands perspective. Um, some modifications may be necessary when using CBT with people. Um, increased parental or caregiver involvement could be beneficial. I often recommend that, um, you know, caregivers take people to their therapy sessions, um, maybe even sit in on the first few minutes or the end of the session, have that um, dialogue or conversation with a therapist, let them know what's been going on, what they've been working on, um, really have a good understanding of what, you know, you're addressing and trying to receive support for. Send an email if necessary. Um, reinforcement can be helpful. Um, you know, we want therapy to be reinforcing in and of itself, but sometimes just getting people to therapy can be a challenge. So for that question earlier where, you know, someone may not be interested in therapy, you know, what can you do that's going to make therapy reinforcing? Um, so come up with a reinforcement plan, maybe, um, you know, eventually, hopefully that can be faded, but you may want to work with the team to develop a plan with that. Just as equally, if someone's coming out of therapy with homework thing, you know, ERP, we talk about um, there's things that you need to practice at home. So what um, reinforcers can someone be offered at home um, for practicing? You know, good job. You spent that half hour practicing those skills today. Here's your reinforcer. Incorporating a person's own interests into CBT sessions can help make them more effective. You know, we know that visual supports are often very effective with this population. And then role-playing can be really useful. It's a way to kind of really practice those skills um, and kind of switching roles with people as well, and then providing them with choices. Um, other therapeutic approaches that can be effective. So we already mentioned the ERP um, being effective. You know, we're really using that exposure and then the um, response prevention. So, you know, uh, um, how do we manage those triggers that occur to some or that are presented to someone? Social skill training can be useful. You know, this can be particularly beneficial prior to beginning CBT um, for individuals who also have autism, you know, really developing those social skills to make therapy more effective in the first place. Um, you know, you can go, you're going into that therapy session then in a better mindset if you um, are, you know, if you're really able to socially interact well with your therapist. Um, this can also help people better understand their behaviors um, that are atypical. So those behaviors that we see as problematic, um, go, you know, having those social skills training around that can help people develop an understanding of that um, and it can help them connect better with others socially. Um, mindfulness training can be good, you know, kind of helping people, you know, really take that step back, calm down, you know, understand what's going on, um, focusing on their body and what's going on in their body and where they're feeling things. Um, implementing mindfulness training and social skills training first, and then gradually implementing ERP and CBT can be highly beneficial. And then finally, behavior modification can be an effective tool. Um, so for people with autism, gains from therapy tend to be incorporated into their daily lives and have proven to be effective but also be narrowly applied and difficult to transfer at times. So that is one barrier that, um, you know, we do see is that, um, you know, for someone with autism, you might have to focus on one specific thing and then um, focus on something else next because they can't necessarily transfer that task, that thing that you're working on from one thing to the other. 
Um, some case studies I found with regards to ERP um, were um, that I thought were helpful, um, or so, sorry, with ERP, some other things that can be helpful include token economies and modeling of behaviors. Um, and then some case studies that um, I found were that um, for someone who carries or holds an object for an extended period of time, you know, we know that people often carry things with them. Um, this, you know, may be comforting, but may not always be appropriate, especially for an adult, for example, who carries a stuffed animal with them. Um, working researchers found that fading the size and time that that object was available to them was helpful um, until it could be eliminated. And then um, for someone who had an obsession around throwing non-trash items away or tidying things, um, researchers would present items to that person and say, is this trash? And then follow that, um, teach them, you know, is this trash? No, well then we're not throwing it away. And they basically put that behavior on extinction. So they blocked all attempts to throw away non-trash items um, until that person stopped engaging in that behavior. Danielle, I know we're short on time. Um, we spent quite a bit of time answering questions throughout. Um, typically we do that more at the end. I've got, I think three more, four more slides, three more slides. Do you want me to keep going? Yep, go ahead okay. and keep going. Um, for anyone that needs to hop off, that's okay. Um, just a reminder, give me about 14 days for continuing education certificates. Um, I will send out the presentation with your certificate. Um, so you will have access to those slides maybe that are missing. Um, and then you will be able to view the webinar on our um, YouTube page, which is accessible through icpn.org. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Megan, go okay. ahead and finish up your last three slides. There was no more um, questions that came through. So okay. um, we'll wrap it up after you're done. Okay, perfect. So I apologize again. Um, normally we do questions at the end and it fit in perfectly. We went a bit longer with questions earlier on. So this is where we're gonna kind of get into more of those strategies, proactive strategies for managing behaviors um, or managing um, OCD. So um, managing compulsions. So we typically have two choices when managing compulsions with someone and they are to either allow the person to complete the compulsion or to block and prevent them from engaging in that compulsion. And if we're gonna block that, we have to be consistent and block it every single time that that person engages in that compulsion. Um, this can be really hard. Um, and so it really, you know, if it's someone who's in a SILA setting, it really should be a group discussion as to whether or not, you know, that's the approach that you're gonna be taking. Um, you know, so if someone is obsessed with sweeping the floor, are you gonna allow them to have access to that broom to engage in the compulsion of sweeping the floor? Or are you gonna put the broom away and not give them access to it? Or are you at the point where you can keep the broom out and block every attempt they make to gain access to that broom? Um, attempts to reduce, discourage, or stop compulsions may result in an increase in anxiety and or aggression initially. And that's also likely where you're gonna see an extinction burst, where you're gonna see in that increase, you know, and then um, eventually they'll stop um, having as many behaviors around that. Um, medication may also be necessary in these cases in order to make other treatment approaches more effective. So I've often found in this population in particular that um, when someone engages or someone has OCD, especially if they carry a profound, severe or profound diagnosis of OCD, um, that working to um, address or address those behaviors therapeutically is not going to be as effective without having medication on board first. Oftentimes, you know, you can kind of take that edge off and make someone more flexible in their thoughts and their ability to engage in things. It kind of breaks in that rigidity, more work, make them more workable in a sense, um, and be able to really um, address those, um, be, those compulsions by having medication on board first. Um, and that applies to the general population as well. You know, it's often easier to change behaviors when um, we feel better. Um, so, so we'll get into um, the last two slides here about practical approaches for supporting a person who has IDD and carries a diagnosis of OCD. Um, so um, educating people on OCD is a great first step. So that could include caregivers or the individual themselves. Um, you know, you know the people you work with. Um, and so that oh, um, if they carry that diagnosis, know, you know, know whether or not 
them having more information about that diagnosis is good for them. For some people, it may not be. You know, we all work with the clients who get on Dr. Google and start Googling their symptoms and then suddenly, or their diagnosis, and suddenly they have a lot more symptoms than they did the day before. Um, you know, we know that for people, um, for, whereas other people don't do that and can develop a good understanding of their diagnosis and what it means and how it can be treated. Um, anticipating challenging situations. So, you know, you got to, again, make that decision whether or not you're going to, um, you know, present a trigger to someone or be aware that that trigger is there. Um, you know, for, I worked with a woman who um, her, uh, her compulsion was folding clothes and she would obsessively fold clothes throughout her day. She lost hours of sleep every single night, just folding clothes. She would, I don't even know how many times she would refold her clothes. Um, and so we knew that if she had an appointment or a change in her routine, we had to come up with something else for her to do after breakfast, besides going up to her room when she would start literally refolding every item of clothing in her room. Um, she knew what time she had to be ready on time to leave for her day program. But if she, um, you know, if we had some, a change, we had to keep her out of her room. So we, you know, we would come up with something else to engage her in a different area of the home or outside of the home, um, to avoid that. Um, because we, uh, we were late to appointments or we would just miss appointments sometimes before we realized that we had to do something different to support her, um, to not engage in those compulsions. So um, understanding that it can be difficult to work with individuals with OCD, you know, it can be highly frustrating and exhausting. You know, you're constantly having to be on top of things. If you're putting someone on extinction with a compulsion, you're going to have to be watching that person very closely to prevent them from gaining access to the item um, or being able to engage in that behavior. Helping minimize anxiety and stress. Again, you know, um, what can be removed from that environment to help, you um, prevent them from being as stressed by a trigger, um, validating anxious feelings, you know, there's always something to validate. Um, you know, you may not understand or agree with what the person is experiencing, but there's always something to validate. Those feelings are real for that person. Target sources of anxiety with appropriate behavioral interventions. Um, so we kind of talked about some of this already where, you know, we know that, um, triggers exist and that, um, you know, we can adjust our interventions, our, our um, approaches to working with that person to um, reduce that anxiety, modify the environment as needed. Um, so can we remove a trigger? Can we, you know, again, put that, are we going to put that broom away or are we going to allow that person to engage in that behavior? Um, model coping skills and desired behaviors, increased supports, um, use of structured routines, visuals, social stories, productive skill building, all of those can be really beneficial for people. Um, those structured routines that can be a little bit of a sticky point because, you know, using a structured routine can add to a person's um, compulsions or obsessions. So again, that comes down to really knowing the person you work with and whether, you know, a structured routine is going to be effective or beneficial for them. Um, and then offer more pro-social ways to communicate distress. Um, so things like visuals and communication supports, you know, helping people to have effective communication is so, so important. Um, you know, so if that's, you know, giving them a way to say like, this is, this is a trigger, you know, this is something that bothers me. I'm really looking at those functional communication methods. Um, and then establish proactive regulating routines. So sensory, having sensory schedules, movement breaks in place, you know, especially for someone who has a tick disorder, have, giving them time to move and, you know, get those ticks out um, before you're expecting them to sit down and engage in something can be beneficial. <coughs> Excuse me, have available calming aids available or have calming aids available in their environment. So calming spaces, sensory boxes, sensory com or calming items, you know, um, or a calming room. Um, our sense, you know, noise, um, you know, weighted blankets, things like that, uh, you know, addressing their sensory needs. So noise canceling headphones, weighted blankets, weighted vests can be beneficial. Reminders of expectations and changes in routines. Again, this comes down to you really knowing the people you support. So um, are having, um, if someone is going to do better knowing about a change coming up in advance, let them know about that. You know, if someone needs to know that two weeks in advance, tell them. Whereas someone else may need 
a notification of a change in the routine two minutes before. Um, so really, again, working with the people you know and knowing the people you work with, um, you know, to really um, approach that from the method that's best for them. And then giving reminders, you know, for someone who needs that um, reminders of change and expectations before going into something, reviewing that with a social story or giving them reminders a week before, hey, don't forget next week, instead of um, going right to day training, you've got um, your doctor's appointment and then we'll go to day training afterwards. And then two days before and the day before in the morning. Um, so again, knowing the person you work with um, is really gonna help you in this kind of situation. Then actively praise and reinforce appropriate communication and coping skills. So anytime that someone is effectively communicating with you that you know they're triggered by something, that something is um, an obsession for them, or they are trying not to act on a compulsion, really praise that, you know, praise them for engaging in those other skills that are coming out of um, ERP work or um, therapy sessions. Establish a safety plan um, when warranted and implement safety measures as needed. Um, so along with that, you know, working, um, you know, to assess when the behavior may become a safety risk for um, the person or the people around them. And then work with the psychiatrist for appropriate medication management. And that is it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you for everyone who hung on just a little bit longer to get through those last slides. Um, I will send out continuing education certificates and the presentation, um, but thank you again so much. We've had a lot of comments about um, the wonderful information that was provided during this webinar. No problem. Were there any other final questions that came up? Um, there were not. I was. Uh, I had a little bit of discussion with Dallas. Dallas was expressing um, you know, concerns with an individual who was just constantly asking like, who's coming in for next shift? What's, you know, what's for supper, even though a menu is posted, you know, what mm -hmm. time are you going home, et cetera. Um, so we had talked a little bit about things that they've already tried that it may have not responded well to. Um, so, um, I don't know if you have any other insight. Um, they've tried visuals and, um, you know, providing those prompts of writing things down, um, but she does have a, a difficult background with her family not treating her very well. So, um, you and know, that could be a case where to... medication, you know, getting a little bit of medication in there may help with reducing some of that anxiety around that. Um, um, so, you know, it really depends. I'm not a big one for like, oh, be on medication, be on medication, be on medication. But sometimes, like I said, it can be really helpful to kind of get over that hump of um, supporting someone. Okay, and that was it. There was no other questions, um, but thank you again so much. Um, thank you all. Wonderful presentation, Megan. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone.